Pain is one of the most productive indicators on our moral compass. A question about a king. And what would it be like to be an ancient warrior? It is time for the Quick Study Television program. All of this and more coming up. So stay there as we continue. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Henry. I'm Janice. And I'm Corey. And welcome to the Quick Study Television Program. We are delighted that you decided to join us today. We are having a great time as we go through the Bible. It's true, the Bible. That's right. Remember that dusty old book everybody brings out for weddings and funerals and every once in a while to make a swearing in the court? Well, it has a lot to say about life, and today we're going to be talking from Deuteronomy chapter 29 to 30, and in this particular portion of Scripture, we're going to be talking about small gods make small people. Is your God too small? Now, we'll talk about what all that's about coming up later on. We also have Bible archaeology along with Corey, which is what today? Well, we're taking a look at some of the beliefs of the people groups that were living in the Promised Land when Israel goes and takes over. But we're also taking a look at the necessity of ancient warriors. Well, that's really a major culture because uh, we, we've gotten away from that today because of a lot of technology. And uh, that whole performance thing was very important to be able to fight and even defend your own household. Very mm -hmm. interesting. All right, we'll talk about it. What is the Bible IQ question today? Well, we've talked about this king a lot before. Sion was the king of what? Heshbon, Bashan, or Egypt? All right, it's a great, there's several ancient kings, pagan kings mentioned in the mm -hmm. passages for defeat. And we'll talk about that and more as we continue. Let's study on. Here's true enough. English translations of the Bible have a strange and intriguing history. The so-called Great Bible was published in 1539 with notes taken from the first two English translations, the Cobra Bible and, of course, the Matthews Bible. Now, the Archbishop of the Church of England, Thomas Kramer, ordered this translation to be placed in every church. It was so valuable that each Bible was chained to the pulpit of the church pillars to keep it secure. in the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Now this is an exciting time for Israel because it's a transitional time period. Not only is the leadership going to change from Moses to Joshua, but the very lifestyle of the people is going to change. They're going to move into the promised land and begin their journey of becoming an actual established nation, a country. And we see that we can feel that building in these two chapters in, in 29 and 30. We can feel it building as Moses begins to recount their history to them. Well, you and I right now are going to take a look at some common beliefs of the people groups that are living in the promised land while these two chapters are going on. See, the task for Israel is to go in, and it's not just physical, it's not just that they have to take over the land, which they did, but they also have to do that while not being influenced by those pagan cultures. Take a look. <laughs> According to ancient pagan religions, humans were here on earth as servants to gods. These gods seem very human themselves, needing physical food, which humans would sacrifice to them. They would often even fight with other gods over jealous and greedy ambitions. But nevertheless, they were seen as gods who alone 
reside in heaven. Humans, alive or dead, were never to enter those realms. There are some stories of humans attempting to reach heaven. For example, the tale of Atana from Ur and Adapa, the priest who makes it to heaven, only to be cast out. There seems to be a very clear distinction in the ancient world. Humans to be on earth and gods in heaven. Think then how powerful and how strange biblical teaching would have seemed. Teaching in which God does not need human food, but he desires people to be reconciled to him. Think of how bizarre tales like the prophet Elijah's end would have been. God taking Elijah up to heaven while he was still alive and healthy on earth. Very strange indeed. An answer that those humans did not reason out on their own. Now the covenants of God are not restricted to the circumstances of men or bound by the laws of this universe. God is above time and space. God renews the covenants with his people, the land that hated them, ancient Moab. Remember that? They tried to curse them. Chapter 29 begins that refreshing of the covenant with God. But these are prophetic passages as well. Chapter 30 explains to the people what they will do in the future. Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 10. Now it shall come to pass, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice, according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Also, the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you and you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God, to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law. And if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 1 through 10. The Bible is always multidimensional. As we look at Deuteronomy, the passages in Deuteronomy 29 to 30 are prophetic as well as present during the time of ancient Israel. They perfectly predict the future and they impart the history of ancient Israel. So it serves two purposes. Now God puts his covenant in our lives as we respond to him. Even knowing our future failures and following God does already do that. Now there is no randomness to our future with God, although we don't know it, God knows it. He knows every second of it. And this is the nature of God who has foreknowledge. This is what it means to be divine. That while we will fall and fail many times over, he still chose us and he picks us up and he heals us as we return to him. Notice that he heals us as we return to him. Now, there's a pattern here. Every time we walk away from God, we get damaged. But every time we walk to God, we become healed. And so clearly in this passage, we see 
uh, a very important principle. The principle is that the closer we get to God, the more chance we have, or not chance, but the more reality it is that our healing comes to play. Now, I want to look at chapter 30, verses 1 to 4, and focus on, there are going to be three truths to live by, and I want to focus on them, but I want you to see the scripture. I want you to see the text, so we're going to put it on the screen. Here is Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 4. Now, it shall come to pass, not maybe, not might, it shall, when all of these things come upon you, and the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, Israel, and you call them to mind. You remember them among the nations where the Lord has taken you out and God has driven you out. Verse 2 says, and then you return to the Lord your God and you obey his voice. You return and obey according to all that I command you today, you and your children and all of your, your heart, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity. Now notice he wants your heart and your soul. And he will have compassion on you and he will gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. Verse 4 says, if any one of you are driven out to the furthest parts under heaven from there, God will gather you and from there he will bring you. Now here is truth to live by, number one. When we lose our sense of moral reality, we will come to our senses in the pain of our decision. You see, there is purpose in pain. See, a lot of times we think that evil is that which pains us, or evil is that which says, says we can't do what we want to do when we want to do it. Well, that's, that's not evil. Many times, and oftentimes, that's God's discipline. And so God says to ancient Israel, when you are in your pain, when you are driven out to those faraway places, like a shepherd, Jesus would use this principle, going to get the one lost sheep, I'll get every single one of you back, when you come to your senses because of the pain, when you realize, like a prodigal son, sitting in the squander with pigs, when you realize that, I'm going to come and get you. So it's even better than the prodigal son, the father comes and gets us. And so we see this very interesting characteristic of God that he uses the pain in our lives to draw our attention back to him every time. Now, I realize some pain is for different reasons and other people cause us pain, but God's name is Redeemer, and he always has a way of taking that in our life which we seem is unredeemable and changing it for good. There was a scripture about that, all things work together for good. Remember that one? Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. Then the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, going to bring you back to your purpose, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Verse 6 says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. Look at that. That's in the, Deut the law of Deuteronomy. He will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. To do what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Now, here's the difference between man's discipline and God's discipline. Man's discipline frequently brings judgment and condemnation. But you know what God's discipline brings? It always brings healing. And that's why Romans says in chapter 8, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So here we see the idea of circumcising the heart, which Jesus talked about and Paul talked about in the play right here in the book of Deuteronomy. Is that intense or what? Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 9 and 10, The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will, look at this line, again, rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. Verse 10, If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of the law, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of yourself, three times that's put in this, these first few verses. Here it is, the final truth to live by. Many think change brings better future, but actually the Bible says return brings the best future. Return to God. Return to me, God says, over and over again of our present day culture. We don't need to change our God. We need to return to the one true God. And that is exactly the message that he sent to ancient Israel, a prophetic scripture in Deuteronomy.
We are about to venture into a very violent uh, area, a very violent portion of scripture. We're about to go into the time period of the judges and the kings of Israel. And we're here at the very end of Deuteronomy, right before we jump into all of this. Now, it shocks a lot of people today, a lot of people in the Western culture, at just how violent the Bible uh, portrays everything that was going on. But it really shouldn't be a shock. See, that's just the reality of the ancient world. That's the reality of the world today in many other areas of the world. That's the reality of sin. And the Bible tells it like it is. Well, you and I right now, we're going to take a look. We're going to focus in on this ancient culture and this idea of the warrior. Just how important it was to be able to fight and what that meant. There might be a little bit of spiritual implication that we can take from this. It may not take a huge leap for many of us to believe that there was great importance placed on being a brave warrior and soldier in ancient times. Battles, wars, and takeovers were commonplace. Empires trying to expand and cities trying to survive. There were even gods of war in the various pagan religions. Assyrian and Babylonian literature hint at how men with experience in battle would gain honor, respect, and glory. But as their ideology went, those men who chose to stay home would never know the true joy of manhood. This ideology of the ancient soldier was a grand one, and no doubt, it was necessary for their military success. It's interesting then to contrast that ideology with that of King David of Israel. King David was a man famous for his victories, famous for his band of expert fighting men. In the Psalms, David gives all the victory credit to God, and he speaks against pointless fighting, pointless wars. Apparently, his military victory was achieved without promising glory to men. David's secret? To honor his God. Is the God in your mind too small to create the vast universe? Is it necessary for you to rationalize God with the natural events of nature to make your faith comfortable? These are just some of the questions that Rod and Ryan Hembry are confronting head on with the Bible and science. Ryan Hembry, senior producer of Quick Study Television and head of production at Studio 34, is a creation science student who has probed and investigated some of the finest scientific minds in the world, only to discover that the God of the Bible is a whole lot bigger than most Christians think. Join Rod and Ryan Hembry in this new DVD called Cosmic Mysteries Reach for the Truth, as together they explore the reality of a God big enough to create the universe we live in, and more. To get your DVD right today, P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. When you send $20, that'll cover our cost to get the DVD to you. Anything above $20, we'll use to keep Quick Study strong and on the air. You can call as well at 519-940-8338, or you can call 724-733-8336. You can also order your DVD online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Places, people, 
Ancient scribes record amazing truth. Ancient scribes record amazing truth. In recent times, mankind has patted himself on the back for the creation of vast ocean liners, gigantic ships to sail the oceans. But the Bible specifically perfects dimensions for a water-stable vessel in Genesis 6.15. It's called Noah's Ark. Shockingly, shipbuilders today are well aware that the ideal dimensions for ship stability is a length six times that of its width. God told Noah to make his ark these exact dimensions over 4,500 years ago. No one wants to invest in someone who will fail, but God does. No one wants to place their hope in something that won't work, but God did. God chose ancient Israel and placed his covenant with them. God is faithful. Those who have responded to Jesus Christ, making him Lord in their life, well, God chose them even though we personally fail. God knew that we would choose him, so he chose us. Since God is outside our realm of understanding, we cannot know the majesty of his grace and his love by any stretch of the imagination. But believe me, we're very glad for that grace and we're very glad for that mercy. Keep in mind that as we look at this particular passage and as we focus on these covenants that God is making, at the time he's making the covenants, he is also, because he has foreknowledge, seeing the failure of Israel, his people. And at the time he saves us, he sees our fallops, our bleeps, and our blunders, not just in the past, but in the future. That, to me, is absolutely staggering. And that's why Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 1, the grace he has lavished on us um, in, in our election. And it's very, very interesting. Corey, when you studied today on archaeology, what is the most striking thing that came out to you on this particular report? Uh, well... Armena letters. Uh, well, actually, this one was common beliefs of the people. Oh, right, and, right. And also cult, the culture of warriors uh, that happened in... The, the culture story. of warriors. Now, now we often see these movies that it's all about being able to defend your house and defend... You know, what was the Russell Crowe movie, the recent one there, where he was uh, back in the uh, in the ages and he... Robin Hood, that was it. Okay, yeah. Robin the Hood. Honor you know. the, the, the honor and the glory. The honor and all. Everybody's, you mm -hmm. know, about defending. It was all mm -hmm. about defending yourself. Mm -hmm. That really was a, a big part of ancient life, it wasn't was, it? It was a huge part. I mean, and, and when, when um, nations did have armies and uh, there were some men who didn't join, not very many, but there were some men who didn't join the army. If you were in an organized nation, those men were actually ridiculed and looked down upon because it was, it's so ingrained in the culture that you need to have honor, that you need to be able to, to fight, that you need to be able to uh, fight for the right thing. And so it was really interesting, and, and hired soldiers were not looked upon with the same respect as soldiers who were fighting for a cause because they believed in it. And that's an interesting dynamic to look at. Now, of course, there's nasty stories as well. Human nature is human nature. Uh, there, it's not all glorious and honorable and by any stretch of the imagination, but it's interesting to see what happens to human nature when it's necessary for survival to have to protect. You know, Janice Curry brings up an interesting point, and we could parallel that today as we look at, at this side of the cross. God has no mercenaries, uh, hired soldiers. And yet there are some today that would say, you know, I'll go with God as long as I'm wealthy. I'll go with God as long as I have what I want. I'll go with God as long as he pays me okay. But if the pay's not there, forget about going with God. That's like being a mercenary. It is. Mm -hmm. God has no mercenaries. And either you love the Lord Jesus Christ or you don't, mm -hmm. unconditionally. Whether you're blessed or whether you're not, like Job did, you love the Lord no matter what. And so did Paul. Mm -hmm. Paul was confused by God sometimes. He didn't understand why uh, God didn't do things the way he would do them. But, but Paul was faithful. And that's something we need to remember, isn't it? It's right. It's knowing who God is. Well, that, that, that's what theology is. That's what it's all about. Is under, and the more you understand who he really is, the more it, it begins to make sense. That's right. Well, you, you, may, you may not understand it while you're going through something, but if you are patient and you wait upon the Lord, you will see 
the outcome. God is for you. He's wait not against you. upon the Lord, but who mm -hmm. wants to wait? We live in a culture where we get what we want when we want it now. We flick the flicker on television and we get happy on the comedy mm -hmm. channel or we get sad on the dramatic channel with the disease of the week or whatever it is mm -hmm. we're doing. We don't want to wait on the Lord. But God says, I will not, I will not uh, caress myself to your lifestyle. I want you to know me. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. All right. Interesting. All right, let's go to the uh, Bible challenge, ladies and gentlemen. Here it is, Corey. Sion. Sion was the king of Heshbon, Bashan, or Egypt. All right. What do you think, Corey? I believe he was the king of the first one. What was that called? Heshbon. Heshbon. Heshbon I think. I'm pretty sure. I am going to throw all of my, uh, my faith in Corey's answer. All right. Deuteronomy 29, verse 7 does say that Sion was the king of Heshbon. Very interesting, and, and these kings are mentioned by name, they are. Uh, mm -hmm. the defeated kings. Mm -hmm. So not only are God's people mentioned by name, but the defeated kings are going to be mentioned by name too. I believe that's part of the white throne judgment. That's another story for another day. Right now, we need to focus our attention on watch and pray. Here's some folks who need your help. Join with them, won't you? you've been listening for some time now to the program quick study as we've gone through the Bible and your heart is is a little bit well maybe uneasy with where you are right now with what you have that may be the conviction of the Holy Spirit I'm not talking about some kind of ghost or some kind of you know spiritual thing you've seen on Ghostbusters I'm talking about the real deal the Spirit of God he's the one who created you and he has the ability to talk to your spirit he may be talking to you right now saying it's time to come home, meaning it's time to come back to Christ, meaning it's time to get your life with God corrected so that you can get in the purpose he made you for and, and your life will go a whole lot better that way. I invite you to come to Jesus. It's time to come home. You say, well, Rod, how do I do that? You, you pray a prayer like this and you say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and you rose again and I decide today to make you Lord of my life. Please help me. He will respond. Thank you for joining us today on the Quick Study Television program. We'd like to remind you that if you don't receive your Bible guide, why not? If you'd like to receive a sample Bible guide, you can send a letter to us with an offering in any amount. We'll tell you how you can get on the mailing list and get that every week. For more information, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com.